Smith. Good, good, after, <clears throat> good afternoon. I'm Graham Allison, the Douglas Dillon Professor of Government and Director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs here at Harvard's Kennedy School. And it's my great honor to welcome our speaker this afternoon, former Senator Sam Nunn. Senator Nunn is with us today as the inaugural Robert McNamara Lecturer on War and Peace. The topic about which he will speak, Nuclear Danger, the Race Between Cooperation and Catastrophe, is propitious as we come to the final weeks of a hotly contested presidential campaign and find ourselves in the throes of a global financial meltdown. It's also especially fitting that we pause today uh, to recall that 46 years ago this week, President John F. Kennedy and Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev faced off in an eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation that risked consequences far beyond the financial crisis we're thinking about today. On October 17, 1962, leaders of the United States and the Russian governments contemplated war, including the possible use of nuclear weapons, in what historians agree was the most dangerous moment in human history. Our plan for this afternoon is to begin with a brief comment from me about the new McNamara lecture and the introduction of Senator Nunn. At Senator Nunn's request, we'll then proceed in Davos style with my interviewing him, in effect, asking questions, what, which I hope will be uh, some of the most important questions on people's minds here this afternoon. But then we'll open the floor to other questions so you can get your questions ready, and we'll have an opportunity to hear from the audience. And because everyone's on very tight schedules, uh, we're going to have to close promptly at 5.30, so that's the game plan. Let me say how especially pleased uh, we are, and Secretary McNamara and I were just talking earlier, uh, to have uh, uh, here Sam Nunn as the first McNamara lecturer, but let me say how pleased we are here at Harvard and to have uh, for this inaugural lecture uh, present President Kennedy's former Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, and his wife, Diana. Bob is now 92 years young. Maybe actually, let me get him to stand up so people can at least welcome him. And on the, on the screen, you'll see uh, Secretary McNamara with President Kennedy uh, in uh, one of the many, uh, on one of the many occasions in which uh, Secretary McNamara uh, earned his reputation with President Kennedy as his most valuable counselor about issues of war and peace. A graduate of Berkeley and of the Harvard Business School, Bob McNamara served in the U.S. Air Force in World War II, returned to join the Ford Motor Company, where he rose to become its chief executive officer. In 1961, President Kennedy selected him as his Secretary of Defense, where he served under Kennedy and Johnson through the Vietnam War until 1968, when he became President of the World Bank, where he served until 1981. Bob McNamara played an important role in the creation of Harvard's Kennedy School as well as a key counselor to Bobby Kennedy and Jacqueline Kennedy as they thought about a living memorial for John Kennedy. Uh, he's been a frequent visitor to the school, having spoken here at the Forum on five previous occasions, on the Cuban Missile Crisis, on his own book on Vietnam, on the Earl Morris film Fog of War that draws lessons from McNamara's experience in war and peace, and in personal reflections on RFK. And for those of you who missed previous forums, you can go to the forum website at the Institute of Politics and view them, and I can tell you they make some very good viewing. 
The McNamara Lecture on War and Peace was established by a gift from the McNamara family and will be given here annually at the Kennedy School, seeking to, eliminate, to illuminate key lessons from history for future policymakers seeking to avoid war and to build peace. Last year, when Secretary McNamara and I were talking about who might be the best candidate to inaugurate the McNamara Lectures, we each had in mind one person, Sam Nunn. Uh, Sam graduated from Georgia Tech and Emory Law School. After serving in the Coast Guard, he began as a staffer in the uh, House of Representatives, a position to which a number of graduates from this school uh, go and even more aspire to go. He then had the courage to run for office himself, uh, a path which we hope more and more graduates of the Kennedy School and Harvard will take. He was elected to the Senate and served there for 24 years, rapidly rising to become the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, where he won the respect of colleagues on both sides of the aisle for his knowledge and his seriousness about national security. Among his many legislative achievements, was the legendary Nunn Luger Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, a bipartisan initiative spearheaded in 1991 by Senator Nunn and his Republican colleague, Senator Dick Luger, that's widely recognized as the most significant congressional initiative in national security in the period since World War II. Thanks to the Nunn Luger Initiative, and lots of hard work by Americans and Russians with financial assistance provided by Nunn Luger, 3,200 strategic nuclear weapons and more than 10,000 tactical nuclear weapons that had been left outside of Russia when the Soviet Union disappeared were all recovered, returned to Russia, and many of these warheads dismantled and blended down to become fueled for low-enriched uranium fuel rods that are burnt in civilian nuclear reactors. Since leaving the Senate, Senator Nunn and Ted Turner have joined together in creating a new action foundation. It's sometimes called venture philanthropy, or some people even call it adventure philanthropy, but in any case, called a nuclear threat initiative. NTI has rapidly become the leading advocate of uncommon sense on all things nuclear. NTI not only supports analyses of nuclear threats and formulations of proposed initiatives for combating these threats, it actually puts its money where its mouth is to try to make things happen. In 2002, providing $5 million of private money to eliminate three bombs worth of nuclear material that had got left in Belgrade, Yugoslavia, and that the governments were unable to do anything about. In 2006, going to the IA and putting on the table a $50 million check from Warren Buffett as a challenge grant to the international community to create an international fuel bank as a to provide fuel to countries that will forego enrichment. And most recently, just in last month in Vienna, announcing and establishing the World Institute for Nuclear Security, which will codify and share best practices in nuclear security globally. In the last two years, Senator Nunn has joined three other stalwarts in the American national security community. Clinton's Secretary of Defense, Bill Perry. Nixon's Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger. And Reagan's Secretary of State, George Shultz, as what the, some call the four horsemen, who are advocating urgent action to, com to combat trend lines that they argue threaten the collapse of the nuclear order, of the global nuclear order. So please join me in welcoming our inaugural McNamara Lecture, Sam Nunn. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Is that it? Thank you. 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 Thank
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I noted earlier uh, that this is an anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. With apologies to Senator Nunn, whom I already mentioned this to, and to Secretary McNamara, I'll confess that there are some students at Harvard, perhaps even at the Kennedy School, whose uh, knowledge of history is less than it should be. Uh, I, me I, I mentioned to Sam that after one event here on the Cuban Missile Crisis, someone came up, a student after, and said, this was so fascinating, but nobody, nobody made it clear whether this was before or after World War II. Okay. <laughs> so, on October 17, in 1962, yes, that's a long time ago, okay, uh, 46 years ago, President Kennedy and his Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, and his brother, Bobby Kennedy, who was the Attorney General, and his special counsel, Ted Sorensen, whom some of you saw here last spring, and a number of others who became the Executive Committee of the National Security Council, sat around a table deliberating about what actions to take in response to Khrushchev's attempt to sneak nuclear-tipped missiles into Cuba. Kennedy determined from the outset that Khrushchev's re reckless adventure would not be allowed to succeed. Were it to do so, he feared that Khrushchev would be emboldened to take even more reckless actions, especially against Berlin. He was, he, Kennedy was prepared, therefore, to take actions even actions that he recognized might increase the risks of nuclear uh, of war in the short run in order to assure that the missiles were withdrawn. So if you don't know the rest of the story, I'm not going to tell you. Okay? But to start the conversation this afternoon, I want us to watch a short rerun from an earlier forum here at the Kennedy School with Secretary McNamara discussing lessons of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And my first question to Senator Nunn will be to ask for your own reflections about the Cuban Missile Crisis and what lessons it may hold for combating nuclear danger today. So if we could run the clip, please. On that monitor. lesson of the Cuban Missile Crisis is this. The indefinite combination of human fallibility and nuclear weapons will destroy nations. Is it right and proper that today there are 7,500 strategic offensive nuclear warheads of which 2,500 are on 15 minute alert to be launched by the decision of one human being. It wasn't until January 1992, in a meeting chaired by Castro in Havana, Cuba, that I learned 162 nuclear warheads, including 90 tactical warheads, were on the island at the time of this critical moment of the crisis. Uh, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And Castro got very angry with me because I said, Mr. President, let's stop this meeting. I, I, this is totally new to me. I, I, I'm not sure I got the translation right. Mr. President, I have three questions to you. Number one, did you know the nuclear warheads were there? Number two, if you did, would you have recommended to Khrushchev in the face of a U.S. attack that he used them? Number three, if he had used them, what would have happened to Cuba? He said, number one, I knew they were there. Number two, I would not have recommended to Khrushchev. I did recommend to Khrushchev that they be used. Number three, what would have happened to Cuba? It would have been totally destroyed. That's how close we were. 
So, Bob, uh, <laughs> did often to, uh, to people, and Ted Sorensen has written about this, that having looked over the nuclear precipice, we didn't want to go there again. And so one saw the beginning of initiatives like the hotline, the limited test ban treaty, uh, permissive action links, uh, locks on nuclear weapons, and other items that were trying to reduce nuclear danger. Now, uh, you've even gone further than that. So watching that, given nuclear weapons and their potential consequences and human fallibility, therefore the lesson is what? Uh, Get rid of them. Uh, before you start and say that's absurd, just think about it. And let me say, I'm in favor of, at a minimum, reducing the number to the point where we're unlikely to destroy the human race with the result number. If, if, if we have, whatever the film says, 7,500 strategic nuclear weapons on 15-minute alert today to be launched by the president, uh, and there are five other, uh, four other declared nuclear powers and three other nuclear powers of smaller numbers, we could all go down to, if you don't want to get rid of them completely, you've got to use them against terrorists or whatever, uh, go down to five or 10 or 20. But we don't need 7,500 ourselves with the Soviets, the Russians having six or 7,000. And it will be possible, it should be possible, and you are the ones to make it possible to reduce that number so your children, your grandchildren will not face the risk of a nuclear war that would literally destroy civilization. Okay. It Let's can be done. So, Senator Dunn, Cuban Missile Crisis, lessons relevant for today. Well, that brings back a lot of history, and uh, seeing Bob McNamara and his wonderful wife, Diana, here, and having uh, the great honor of uh, being the first uh, interviewee or lecturer or whatever the proper term is, is, is really a wonderful thrill for me, and particularly here at the Kennedy School with so much history. That does bring back a lot of memories. Bob, you look just like uh, you did back in 1992, and Graham, you have on the same tie, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> That's the great thing about being a professor. You can get away with that kind of stuff. <laughs> but, I, uh, it brings back a lot of memories to me. I had uh, gotten out of law school at Emory University in 1962 in June, and I went to work in Washington immediately as a staff lawyer for the House Armed Services Committee. Uh, my boss was an old Irishman by the name of John J. Courtney, and my great uncle, Carl Vinson, was the uh, chairman of the committee, so that's, uh, it wasn't my law school grades that got me the job. It was uh, a little bit more f f a family than that, but. I did uh, go to work there, and in uh, early, well, late September of, uh, of 1962, the fall, uh, Mr. Courtney came in and told me that uh, he had a family illness, and he was supposed to go on a three-week trip to Europe, a NATO uh, tour of NATO bases with the U.S. Air Force, with other members of the staff of the House and Senate uh, Armed Services and Appropriation Committee, and he couldn't go, and he wanted to know if I wanted to go in his place. Well, I'd never been north of Washington, let alone out of the country, and so I immediately said yes. So long story short, I went on that trip, and in October of uh, 1962, I was on a U.S. Air Force trip uh, with top secret briefing, being uh, briefed every day about the Cuban Missile Crisis, because we were part of that uh, uh, defense mechanism that was equipped in NATO to deal with the nuclear side as well as the other side, and we were being briefed everywhere we went. And I remember thinking I was at Ramstein Air Force Base the night that was the peak of the crisis, at least in my mind it was, and I remember sitting by the four-star general who was the head of U.S. Air Force Europe, and he was telling me, he had all this communication equipment right behind him, and he was telling me he had only a matter of seconds to give the orders if he received the command to launch his quick reaction aircraft. They call them QRA aircraft. Those were one-way aircraft. They were going to drop the bombs and then they were going to bail out. And they were nuclear carried uh, nuclear weapons on those aircraft. Well, they were going to be the first targets. And they were at Ramstein and several other bases over there. 
And I remember the, the magnitude of, what, of, of trying to absorb what he told me because it was just going to be a matter of seconds. He had only seconds, and if they weren't launched immediately, he had the men sitting there in the aircraft at the very peak of the crisis. They were right by the planes for several hours before that. Uh, basically, they were going to be destroyed on the ground because the Soviets knew that those were going to be the first weapons to hit them, so they were going to target them first. And I remember the magnitude of that, and uh, I remember that I'd met Secretary McNamara in my great uncle's office. He won't remember this, but uh, I was uh, awed to meet the Secretary of Defense and certainly one with the tremendous reputation of Bob McNamara. And I remember thinking that night that I was glad that Bob McNamara was in the White House uh, because of the huge dangers, and I knew that he was a cool, collected, and sound decision maker. So uh, that was my introduction to the possibility of nuclear war. It made a huge impression on me, and I made a decision then that if I ever had an opportunity to help reduce the nuclear dangers and to raise the nuclear threshold so that everybody would have more time before they undertook this kind of god-awful, uh, almost uh, uh, planet-ending uh, kind of military uh, response and action, that I was going to try to do it. So, Graham, that had a big effect on my life at a very young age, and when I got to the United States Senate, I was able to address these issues for, for many years and continue to today. Well, that's a, uh, actually, the, the connection between uh, biography and agendas is a, is a fascinating one, and I, I'd heard a little bit of that story before, but not the whole one. Well, the next one other part of the story, they, the next day we left for Paris. By the time we got to Paris, Khrushchev had backed off. So that was, that was right in the, the peak of it. And uh, I had a friend of mine who had written a young lady in Paris and said that I was going to call her when, uh, when I got there. And I did, and she came and picked me up. She worked for the American Embassy. Her name was Colleen O'Brien, and we met that night. I don't know whether it was the euphoria of being out of the... Uh, uh, danger of a nuclear war, what it was, but I fell in love and three years later we were married. So yeah. uh, that, that was a rather eventful part of my life. The reason it took three years is because it took her that long to fall in love, but I fell in love very quickly. Well, I used to say that nu nuclear fear leads people to do strange things, even for Colleen to marry you. <laughs> uh, Sam, we, we handed out to people coming in, and if you haven't read it before, if you didn't get a chance to read it, uh, uh, I would uh, recommend with enthusiasm this uh, famous uh, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal by the Four Horsemen. Now, there are not four more centered people in the Cold War than these four individuals who played more significant roles. So uh, here they call for, in this op-ed, uh, a, the, for the president and the leaders of other governments to, quote, embrace the vision of a world free of nuclear weapons and to take urgently practical steps towards achieving that objective and then define an agenda of items. Now, I was thinking about this, or as I have from time to time, if we had, or, before this op-ed, which was January of 2007, if we had organized here at the forum a debate on abolishing nuclear weapons, the advocate of that position would have been regarded as radical and kind of outside the, the, the it would be a leftist, uh, almost an extreme leftist position. So what led four of the bluest chips in the national security business and four proud Cold War veterans to a proposition that seems so provocative? Well, I think the leftist position would be to do it unilaterally, and none of us want to do these uh, things unilaterally. We want to go step by step. There are all sorts of steps you've got to take to get to the vision uh, of a world free of nuclear weapons, but President Johnson signed up for that uh, under the Nonproliferation Treaty. Very clearly, if you read that uh, instrument, which we have lived under for a long time, and most of the nations of the world, some exceptions have signed up. Every president of the United States has pledged uh, support for the Nonproliferation Treaty. It has very explicit commitments for a step-by-step -step approach to, to uh, getting rid of nuclear weapons and having a world free. So the, the position, uh, I believe America would be far more secure if no one had nuclear weapons. I also believe we have to do it with others. 
I do not think we can do it unilaterally. I think we have to go step by step. And I think there are a whole series of things we have to do because we've got to get rid of weapon-grade material all over the world, and we've got to make sure we secure that material in the meantime. We've got to get weapons off hair trigger alert uh, because they, they pose a real threat, even with the end of the Cold War, they pose a real threat for some type of accident. We still have several thousand weapons that uh, basically would be fired in a very few minutes. We need to work together with Russia on warning time. It makes no sense at all for, from the United States security point of view, for the President of Russia to have only a few minutes to decide if he is told by one of his generals that they're under attack to launch all of his weapons immediately or lose them. That makes no sense from our point of view. If they get a false warning, guess who gets hit? We do. Uh, so we've got all sorts of things we need to do in our own security interest, and all of those require cooperation. If you do not have cooperation around the globe, starting with the United States and Russia, but including our NATO allies, including China and others, if you don't have that kind of cooperation, we're going to end up with a catastrophe. Not necessarily all-out war, but some type of accident, some type of miscalculation, or what I fear more than anything else is a terrorist attack because the terrorist groups would like to get nuclear material. We have to have tremendous amount of cooperation to get the nuclear material secured around the globe that is weapon-grade nuclear material in over 40 countries. That requires cooperation. So if we don't get that cooperation, we are going to be in jeopardy. As Graham mentioned, the financial crisis we're having today would be small potatoes compared to what would happen if one of American cities went up, even a uh, partial destruction of American city with a nuclear weapon. So all of those things require cooperation. We have to have the steps uh, that we've outlined to secure our country. We have to have cooperation to basically have the steps possible. That's the only way they can be achieved. And without the vision, without people understanding that that's where we're heading, we're not going to get to cooperation. The, we are viewed right now, we and the Russians and the other nuclear powers are viewed by the rest of the world as not living up to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. There are three stools of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. One is, the nuclear powers said, said when we signed up, we will get rid of our nuclear weapons over time. Nobody thinks it's going to be done instantly. The second leg of the stool was that the countries that didn't have nuclear weapons would not develop them. And the third leg of the stool was that everybody in the world, all countries would be able to share nuclear technology if they were in compliance with a non-proliferation treaty. Now all three legs of the stool are breaking down. You can see that in North Korea, you can see it in Iran, and you can see it when you're working in this arena as I do by the lack of willingness by some of our best friends in the world to agree not to start enriching. We're about to have another round of uh, dangerous steps, which is enriching nuclear material. The same process by which you uh, build lower enriched uranium for nuclear power, per, per power purposes, perfectly legitimate. Same technology takes it to high enriched uranium, very difficult to tell when you move from low to high in terms of the technology, and that high enriched uranium is basically a nuclear weapon. So we've got to protect ourselves from terrorists, we've got to protect the world from accidents, we've got to gradually, uh, we've got to gradually build trust in the world, it's not going to be easy. Uh, all of those things have to be done. The h longest pole in the tent of all of this is determining ways to prevent the apprehension in regional areas, the apprehension that leads to countries developing nuclear weapons. That means we have to deal with the European security, the Russians. We've seen recently Russia, Georgia. That makes everything more difficult, but also more important. We see it in the Middle East. We have to deal with the Middle East in terms of getting tensions eased there, and we also have to do it in Southwest Asia, where probably the most, most dangerous part of the world is right there. Yep. So all of those things have to be done, Graham, but uh, in my view, we have to march up the mountain together. Okay. Uh, you, you, you are aware that uh, this is, even though the, this call for embracing a vision of a world free of nuclear weapons has had uh, a big impact, on both presidential candidates, each of whom has essentially endorsed the, sure the concept. Sure it hasn't won universal uh, applause among uh, all of the national security community. So, uh, for example, our colleague at MIT, John Deutsch, uh, and former Secretary Harold Brown wrote another op-ed in the Wall Street Journal in response to your original one, they, which they entitled, quote, 
the nuclear disarmament fantasy. And they argue in that piece that the goal, quote, they say, quote, the goal, even the aspirational goal of eliminating all nuclear weapons is counterproductive. They argue that the goal, that the goal is practically unachievable and that even if it were achievable, it would be undesirable. So which of the skeptics' argument do you find most troubling, and how do you respond to them? Well, first of all, John Deutsch and Harold Brown are tremendous public servants. They've both done a tremendous job for our country in national security and foreign policy. They're both good friends of mine. I have enormous respect for them. And it's also interesting, in that same article, they endorse all the steps. What they don't endorse is the vision. But it's also interesting in that article that they embrace the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And I will have to ask Brother Deutsch how he reconciles embracing the Non-Proliferation Treaty with saying that its principal goal, that is everybody getting rid of nuclear weapons, is totally unacceptable even many, many years after it has been uh, agreed to. So I think there was a fundamental flaw in their article and in their approach. I think the difference is because they do endorse these steps and, and, and therefore We've got a lot to build on, even for people who don't agree with the vision, because we've got to go step by step. We have to build trust. It's going to take uh, a, a long time to do it, because if you, you've got to settle a lot of the regional conflicts or people aren't going to give up their nuclear weapons. Uh, so there's a lot to be built on, even with people who don't accept the vision. The difference is, I have become convinced, five years ago I would have had the same position that Harold Brown and, and uh, John Deutsch have. That would have been my position. I would have felt that way. I've concluded otherwise. First of all, I'm much more concerned about a terrorist without a return address than, that cannot be deterred than I am a deliberate war between the powers. I, I don't think a deliberate war has any rationale at all. And I think if it happens, it's going to happen by accident. I don't think people that are in control of governments, at least the ones who have nuclear weapons today, accepting North Korea and accepting possibly um, uh, around. We certainly don't want other countries to get nuclear weapons, but I don't think it's rational. I don't think it'll happen as long as there's deterrence. But you can't deter a group that's willing to commit suicide. And if, frankly, uh, mutual destruction, United States firing back if one of our cities goes off would be the, one of the goals of a terrorist group. So we're in a different era. We have to understand the world has changed. I, I was in favor of nuclear weapons during the Cold War. Uh, I was worried about them. I worked a long time on their security. I tried to improve NATO defense so we wouldn't have to use the early use of nuclear weapons. We were in a position, the American people didn't realize it. In the 60s and in the 70s and the 80s, we were in a position not only of first use, that was our declared policy in NATO, we were going to use nuclear weapons earlier than anybody thought because we had profound conventional weaknesses in Germany. We were basically going to have requests from our field commanders out there and because I visited with a lot of them, and they'd tell you what they wouldn't tell you in a formal briefing, they'd tell you over a beer at night, and that is that the, almost the first day the, the, the bells went off for the war, a war between the Warsaw Pact and NATO, they were going to request the release, the President of the United States, to release nuclear weapons, to give them the authority. They were going to use battlefield nuclear weapons to go after the tank formations if they mobilized. And that early request was something most presidents didn't realize they were going to get, but they were. So they thought, the people in the field thought, it was going to take the president three or four days to make his decision. They didn't think any president was going to make that decision lightly, and they, I think they were right about that. So they were going to ask earlier than they even needed them because they had to build in that time delay. That was the psychology we were in. Now guess what? Many years after the Cold War, the Russians now feel that they are surrounded. Uh, by NATO. We don't feel that way at all, but they do believe NATO's closing in. They see the aircraft there and so forth and so on. And they have gone, although they didn't during the whole Cold War, they've gone to a first use policy in the last 10 years. So NATO's never gotten rid of its first use policy. Russia now has a first use policy. Now, I don't think we're about to have a war with Russia. I don't think we're going to have a nuclear war with Russia, but we're moving in the wrong direction. We're not heading up the mountain, we're heading down the mountain. And it is, uh, it is very hard to get other countries in the world to basically secure their nuclear material, get, quit producing fissile material, not have a nuclear program, not go into enrichment, which if a lot of countries do, it's going to get more and more dangerous, while we're continuing to make nuclear weapons the first, foremost part of our overall security. And the Russians certainly are, even more than we are. So it's all of that psychology. That's why I differ with Brown and Deutsch, because I don't think they've been out 
in recent years trying to convince countries around the globe, even our best friends, that we've got to have a different direction in the world. Those best friends turn around and say, you are a bunch of hypocrites. You said you were going to do something and you haven't done it. And you're not serious about it. So that's where we, that's where we differ. Okay. Good. Uh, you, you mentioned Russia, so let me go there just for, for a minute. Uh, all of us watched last August as the Russians uh, responded brutally to the Georgian provocation, but crushing Georgia's military forces, occupying the former autonomous zones of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, and then recognizing them as newly independent states. The reaction to that by the US government, the Bush administration, and European governments has been to condemn it and to say that Russia has to pay a price, to argue even that Russia is isolating itself. And many people have actually, and including both presidential candidates, have not only endorsed that, but their campaigns even argue they should keep Georgia as an early candidate for NATO membership. So if you try to think about the need for cooperation with Russia on the one hand, for some part of the agenda, but on the other hand, not wanting them to give them a free, free pass on everything else, how, how, would, you, how would you balance? Well, I made a speech back in Berlin and Karl Kaiser, I think I see Karl back there, back in the spring, uh, several months before the Russia, Georgia, and in that, in that talk I said, that I thought the fact that Russia was not part of the Euro-Atlantic security arrangement, they had no basic role in it, they didn't feel they had any role. I thought it was a failure of U.S. foreign policy. I thought it was a failure of Russian foreign policy, and I thought it was a failure of European foreign policy, and I, I feel that way rather emphatically. We've had all sorts of windows of opportunity to find ways to work with Russia. Uh, for their reasons and our own reasons, we have not done so. Uh, I believe that uh, for anyone to say that Russia is going to be isolated, look at the map and see how you isolate Russia. Uh, nine time zones or ten, whatever it is, you're going to isolate them. And to say they're irrelevant when they have a veto on the Security Council, when they have huge energy resources, and when they basically have enough nuclear power, the only country in the world, to destroy us, and we're going to declare them irrelevant? I mean, that's a joke. Uh, I don't know how anyone could even think that. But, but nevertheless, some people have said that. I think we need to sit down with the Russians. One of the things that disappointed me the most. Certainly I was very, uh, I think it, we need to be critical of what the Russians did. They greatly overreact. They perhaps were provoked. I thought the Georgia president didn't handle himself very well, but nevertheless the Russians overreacted. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think that we need to have a lot of serious discussions with the Russians. The Russians feel like they've been ignored. I think they are wrong in many respects, but they feel like they were ignored on Kosovo. They feel like they've been ignored in NATO expansion. They feel like they have not been treated, in their words, with, with quote, dignity, end quote. Now, I don't agree with most of those Russian perceptions, but for a country as enormously important as Russia is, we need to sit down and listen to them on things. We need to give them some degree of, of, of respect. Uh, a lot of that uh, uh, comes from a, a psychology. Uh, I think we are moving on a path right now where Russia and the United States are acting tactically toward each other. I think we're going more and more toward confrontation with the Russians, and I think we're doing it because of perhaps Cold War nostalgia, perhaps on their side, perhaps on ours, but whatever it is, it's against our fundamental interest. If you look at the interest of Russia and the United States today, and I would add China to that list, and I'd add Europe to that list, and I'd add others, there's more fundamental commonality of interest in security and economic field today than I think there's ever been before in history, but we aren't acting on it. We aren't acting on it. And I think it's short-sighted on the part of leadership. So I don't have a magic answer to how you deal with Russia. They have a, a lot of faults and they do a lot of things we don't agree with. But I do know that we need to work with them. I think it's fundamentally in our security and economic interest. And I also think it's in their fundamental interest. I also think NATO needs to take a deep breath because I think NATO has lost uh, the focal point of what it's really trying to do. We're bogged down in Afghanistan. We're not doing well there. We need more forces there. Our European friends need to put up more in the way of forces there. It's, it's enormously important that we not continue this trend downhill in Afghanistan. It can't just be a military response. It's got to be economic. It's got to be uh, across the board. But we're doing that at the same time we're basically expanding NATO. 
Now, somebody look at the map and tell me how we're going to defend Georgia in the next 10 years without nuclear weapons. Are we going to treat it like Berlin? Uh, these are hard questions that are not being treated. They're being treated politically, but not militarily. We need to ask our military leaders, what, what about Georgia and how are we going to defend it? Right now on the front burner, we need to be talking to the Russians about Ukraine because there's a very large Russian population in Ukraine. The Russians basically have a long-term lease on the Black Sea fleet. They, they depend on that. Uh, it could easily be a problem in Ukraine. The Ukrainian government is in disarray, but we're talking about expanding NATO to take in Ukraine and Georgia. Have we thought through the defensive side of that? Have we thought through the military side of that? Have we thought through the long-term implications of that? Have we backed up and say, what are our vital interests? I don't think we're doing that now. So I, I really believe that we need to take a deep breath. The Russians need to take a deep breath. We need to understand the commonality of interests we have. Uh, I haven't even mentioned Iran. It's going to be extremely difficult to solve the Iranian situation. Preventing them from getting a bomb, I think, is in our vital interest. But it's going to be hard to do that without the Russians' cooperation. And, and I think we need to consider that. So we got to back up and say, what are we doing? I'm not sure. I think we've lost the distinction between our vital interest and what we see as vivid. We've got to distinguish between the vital and the vivid. Okay, I'd say that's a good line. Uh, uh, I've got one, uh, or I've got a hundred questions, but I'm going to ask just one more, and then uh, uh, I'm going to turn to the audience. Uh, let, let me. Uh, re I mean, it's hard to hard to, to remember, but 19 days from the day, uh, there's going to be a new president elect. And let's imagine uh, that in the week after that, uh, Obama or McCain calls you up and says, uh, in the campaign, I actually said something like I agreed with this vision of a world free of nuclear weapons. I got to have a plan of action here for the first six months. Which, what should I have on my list? So what, what kind of advice would you offer? Well, the first thing is, you're not going to, you look at every step on the list of things that have to be accomplished, you're not going to be able to accomplish that without partnerships around the globe, starting but not ending with Russia. You've also got to deal with China. You've also got to deal with the Middle East, and you've also got to deal with Southwest Asia. All of those are critical, and then you're not going to move what I call up this mountain toward a world free of nuclear weapons without dealing with those issues, even if you didn't have the, that is a vision. You still have to deal with these issues. They are, they're enormously important. So I, I think the, the, the list, you participated, Graham. You did a terrific job on a panel. We've had two of them, I believe, where we tried to identify what were America's vital interests, what were America's important interests but not vital, and what were America's, what was the third category? Other. Le other interests. <laughs> uh, I think we've, gotten, uh, we've lost track of the front burnout. During the Cold War, we knew what was vital. We, we knew what was vital. I don't think we know what's vital anymore. I don't think NATO knows what's vital anymore. If they do, they're not acting on it. I think we, we basically have to go back to the drawing board and say what is vital. Unless the American people understand that, every single crisis in the world is treated like it's on the front burner. They're not all the same. They don't all involve our fundamental vital interests. That doesn't mean that we aren't emotionally involved. It doesn't mean that we won't help. It doesn't mean we aren't concerned about humanitarian, but it means we're distinguishing between what really is truly vital to our security. So that would be the first thing, and I'd want any president to, uh, to sit down and, and, and have that kind of discussion at the very beginning point, because from that flow a lot of other things. It's fine to say you want a world free of nuclear weapons, but you also want to take Georgia into NATO next week. It's fine to say you want to basically end the Iranian quest for nuclear weapons, but you want to kick Georgia out of the G8. But those things don't work. They don't go together. You, you, can't do, you can't do that. There's some of them are mutually exclusive and some of them are totally counterproductive. Uh, so we're going to go to the audience now, but the first question uh, we're going to have uh, Secretary McNamara ask if that's okay. And then in the meantime, let me invite you to stand up at the microphones. There are microphones both on the ground floor and on the first floor or the first loges. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll start with Secretary McNamara, and then I'll give you the ground rules. But Secretary McNamara is going to make the first question or comment. Uh, please, Bob. First, I want to thank Senator Nunn for coming tonight. 
his lecture is exactly what we need to hear. And by the way, sir, your great uncle, uh, Carl Vincent, would be proud of what you said. I knew him very well. He was a tough man. But on this issue, he'd be right with you, I'm sure. And my question is this. Do you think it's practical now, building on what you and Henry Kissinger uh, started, to try to organize an international movement to eliminate nuclear weapons within, say, five years? Well, I would agree with everything but the five years. I think uh, it's going to be hard to set a timetable because you've got to deal with these issues. I do believe that we ought to have a goal of greatly de-emphasizing nuclear weapons, keeping them out of dangerous hands, and ultimately ending them as a threat to the world. In other words, going to zero. I see it as a, as a climb up a mountain. I mean, if you, look, if you identify the top of the mountain as a world free of nuclear weapons, that's the goal. And I think we ought to keep that goal in mind. Right now, we can't see the top of that mountain. It's very difficult to see. But we can see that we're heading down. We're heading down the mountain. We're not heading up. And we can see that we've got to identify trails leading upward, and we've got to follow those trails and get others to lead, go with us. And we're going to have to get to a base camp, and then from that point, there are going to be a lot of hard questions at the base camp level. But if we want our children and grandchildren to have any hope of seeing the top of the mountain, and in the meantime, to help prevent a catastrophic terrorist attack, which Graham wrote the book on, here in the United States, we've got to have that kind of world movement. Now, we in our own way have started that effort. Carl Kaiser, Carl, hold up your hand, people, you're right here at Kennedy. Carl organized a meeting for us in Germany. Uh, Helmut Schmidt was there and a number of other people from Germany uh, were there. Uh, it was a very good discussion. And I think we made progress in terms of explaining where we were coming from. Germany would be an extremely important ally in all of this. Uh, and they would also be very important in, in getting the Russians and finding the right way to involve the Russians in the Atlantic uh, NATO security arc. Uh, the other thing we've done, we've had a meeting in, in London. We had a meeting with a number of the former foreign ministers and defense ministers of Great Britain. Gordon Brown, who is the leader of Great Britain, has endorsed this effort. Uh, his Secretary of State uh, then, at the time, uh, Margaret Beckett, made a, a speech endorsing this effort explicitly in Washington, and Gordon Brown has, has uh, also endorsed it. So there's another nuclear country, that is Great Britain, that has embarked on the same effort. Interestingly enough, in this, in this country, uh, two-thirds of the living former Secretaries of Defense or Secretaries of State or National Security Advisors have endorsed this effort. So two-thirds. John Deutsch and Harold Brown are the exception. <laughs> tell, brother, tell his brother Deutsch he's in the minority on this one. But nevertheless, so it, it is beginning to attract attention. The Prime Minister of Australia has endorsed this effort. They now have an organization between Japan and Australia that are embarked on this. And Bill Perry, uh, former Secretary of Defense, is on that panel. Kissinger and Schultz and I are all advisors to that. So it's beginning, it's beginning to move. But it is a tall mountain. Uh, it is hard to see the top right now, and we do have to do a lot on, on, uh, on steps. Now, one step that is enormously important. Uh, I've never believed uh, in Star Wars the way President Reagan defined Star Wars. I've always believed in missile defense. That's two different visions. Nevertheless, Reagan had a dream when he started the SDI program, although he described it in ways that I didn't agree with at the time. Uh, but he had a dream that we would work with the Soviet Union with missile defense and get rid of offensive weapons. Reagan said over and over and over again he wanted to get rid of all the weapons in the world. So it cannot be a far leftist position, Graham, uh, if, if it was Ronald Reagan's dream. And he said it while he was president, he said it a number of times after he was president. Well, it, it basically, we have, we have now got an opportunity. Uh, and the, the, the biggest opportunity on the U.S.-Russia list is working with them on missile defense. Uh, we have announced, Rumsfeld announced we were going to put in a uh, missile defense system in Czech Republic and Poland. Russia has gone up the wall on it, but Putin came back with an offer. He said, why don't you not put it in Poland and Czech Republic, put it in Russia, we'll work with you. Now, whether that was tactical or strategic, you all had the brilliance to take the Khrushchev reply during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and took the best side of it. Uh, but whatever you might think of Putin's offer, 
It's an enormous opportunity. If we can work with the Russians on a missile defense system, probably some parts of it in Poland and Czech Republic, some parts of it in Russia, there's an enormous opportunity. If we're working together on defense, and we basically have systems where we really want more warning time, and we want to make sure that countries like Iran and others cannot strike Russia or our allies in Europe, then it makes an enormous amount of difference. We probably could scratch our heads after four or five years of working together on defense and say, why do we still have 2,000 weapons pointed at each other on hair trigger alert? It would be an enormous psychological breakthrough. And for those people who say that you can't get to the top of the mountain, think of the world if we did have that kind of working relationship with Russia. It would change immensely. The Chinese, for instance, have never uploaded, or I hadn't been briefed in a couple of years, so I may be out of date on this. That's a, a caveat, and I hadn't had a, a, a classified briefing on this. They Formally, the Chinese didn't match their warheads with their missiles. They separated them, which is a whole lot safer position than having them ready to fire with a hair trigger. I'm hoping the United States and Russia will increase warning time for each other, work together on warning systems, work together on missile defense, and that we will encourage the Chinese to continue that. I don't want the Chinese to get more like us before we get more like them. Because if they upload their missiles and they build a huge number and they put them on submarines, we've got a, a real problem. Let me add two other things to, to tell, tell our friends Harold Brown and John Deutsch to think about. Because they're both smart as a whip. I'm, I'm, I'm a great admirer. Submarines. We've got a proliferation of submarines with nuclear weapons. How do you know who fired a weapon if it hits your shore, if it came out of a submarine? Are we sure that the Russians would know if a Chinese submarine pulled up and fired a missile into Russia that it wasn't us? That's a, that adds a whole nother dimension to it. I worried about that during the Cold War. I worry about it even more now. Pakistan and India, both working on submarines. Israel, submarines, all nuclear. Uh, that's a huge difference. Another one, think about digital. We're in a world of digitization. Uh, the internet security side, command and control. Do we have confidence that every country that has nuclear weapons has total command and control and cannot be penetrated in their network with false orders given? I don't. I think our system is probably sound in that regard, although it needs checking all the time. We're in a different world. We're not in the Cold War world, and we've got to adjust to that. Our security requirements now are fundamentally different than they were during the Cold War. Okay, we're going to the audience now. Let me explain the ground rules. Uh, introduce yourself, uh, ask a question briefly, and questions in with a question mark. And we'll start with this gentleman, please. Uh, thanks very much, Senator Nunn. My name is Guy Roz. I cover the Pentagon for NPR, but I'm not doing a story today, so not to worry. Um, on the missile defense issue, I mean, given Russia's intransigence on this issue and the agreements that have been reached with Poland and the Czech Republic, would it be worthwhile considering scrapping missile defense um, as an incentive to Russia? It'd be worth considering slowing down the program with Poland and Czech Republic. Uh, I think it ought to be slowed down. We've got a, a, a system that has not been fully tested and we got a threat that has not yet emerged. So we have a premature system being deployed against a premature threat. The point is, we've got time. We do not have to rush it. It's also interesting, speaking of NATO, that Poland basically reluctantly went along and they demanded a very high price. I haven't yet seen an article showing how much we paid in order to deploy a system to defend the people in Europe. Uh, it, it really is a, it's a curious position. It's also curious that the Poland demanded, and I can understand that point of view, but I, I think it's an ominous sign, they demanded a bilateral agreement. We've never seen that agreement. I haven't. With the United States on security assurances that must go beyond Article 5 of NATO or otherwise they wouldn't need it. Article 5 says we're all going to defend each other. Poland's part of NATO. What's wrong with Article 5? If Poland needs a bilateral agreement with the United States for their security, um, what about other countries? What does that say to them? Uh, do they need a bilateral too? Does it mean that NATO's credibility is eroding or has eroded in the eyes of the Poles? This has been given far too little attention. So I don't think we should abandon the whole missile defense effort 
right at this point. I think a missile defense, I've always had in mind a missile defense that could protect against a very small number of weapons, particularly an accidental launch. You know, when we fire up a satellite, we can destroy it if it looks like it's going to hit somewhere where it shouldn't, or if it's going to come down, if it's a fall. We can't do that with missiles. When they're fired, they're gone. We can, if we fire one by accident, or the Russians do, we can call up and say, sorry, one's heading your way with a nuclear warhead. We didn't mean it. It was an accident. We can't shoot it down. I mean, it's incredible that we're in this position today, but we are. And, and we've got to start thinking about those things. So I wouldn't counsel the missile defense system, but I do think I would, I would certainly advocate to the next president that they stop, look, and listen, and slow it down some. And I think NATO itself needs to step up to the plate on this. Uh, and I don't think NATO has. Gentlemen, in the yes. lounge, please. Yes. Um, I'm Christian Newis. And I come here a lot. My question is, what are the chances of Russia, the Ukraine, and Georgia joining NATO and the, and, and the EU? Do you think they ever will? Okay. So the question is, uh, Russia and Ukraine joining NATO and, and Georgia. the EU? Yeah. Well, jo jo joining NATO and the EU. I always thought in Georgia that, as well. Yeah, I Thank thought you. I thought at the end of the Cold War that we should have expanded economically and basically looked for a different type security arrangement because there wasn't a military threat. We used NATO to mean you're accepted in the West, and that was a huge psychological thing. And I understand those countries that had been behind the Iron Curtain wanting to be part of NATO. If we had used, and the European friends would have had to decide that, not us. If the European community had been the, the, the basic focal point rather than the military side, it would have been a different psychology with Russia. But I lost that argument a long time ago, back in the 1990s. But at this stage, we need to, I was talking to Graham beforehand, it's, it's time for us to, to, to really think about what our vital interests are, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. I, I think Russia, I'm not sure Russia would ever want to be in NATO. I'm not sure that an organization called NATO would attract that much interest to Russia because it has got a history there in psychology. But Russia does need to be part of the Euro-Atlantic security arrangement. And we need to broaden our concept of what that arrangement is. I hope our German friends will begin thinking along that line. There's some indication that, that, that their leadership is. Uh, so I don't think Russia itself would join NATO. Both Russia, I mean both Georgia and Ukraine, there's an indication definitely Georgia wants to join. And NATO has said Georgia is on the list to join. They've got a uh, qualifying in a lot of respects that they haven't yet. Ukraine is split. Ukraine has one faction that wants to join and another faction that doesn't want to join. Russia has a, a lot of, of, of Russian ethnic people in, in Ukraine. Uh, the Black Sea Fleet comes very much into play there. They've got a long-term lease, I think 2015 or 2017. Uh, I think that all comes into play. And then you have to ask yourself a question. If Georgia had been part of NATO, when the Russians decided to go in, would the Russians have not gone in? Or if they had gone in and we hadn't done anything about it, what would have happened to NATO? What would, would NATO's credibility have been completely shot? I don't know the answer to that. Would Russia have stayed out even though we didn't have the military capability to do anything about it? Would they have stayed out? I doubt it, particularly after their peacekeepers were killed. So I guess I'm back to my point. I think we've got to go back and connect the military side of NATO with the political side. Right now, I think there's a very big disconnect. Go to the lady in the lunch, Janet Ling. And Janet, introduce yourself, please. Uh, you just did. Thank oh, you, Graham. Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, my question has to do with the nonproliferation treaty and particularly Pillar 1 that you talked about, the responsibility of the U.S. and the other declared powers to work toward uh, lessening their dependence on nuclear weapons. And you also talked about that, in fact, since we really haven't, none of, none of the main uh, powers have done that, that there's just an immense uh, lack of trust among uh, nations. They don't think we're serious. We want our nuclear weapons, but we don't want theirs. So given that context, um, would there not be some unilateral activities that the US could undertake that would not open us to any additional risks, but that could really go a long way to helping that uh, trust deficit, and if there are, what might those be? If there aren't, what would the argument against it be? 
Thanks. I believe there are unilateral steps that we can take. I'd start with the comprehensive test ban treaty. The fact that the Senate didn't ratify that uh, and actually voted it down was a huge blow to our nonproliferation efforts around the globe. That was a huge blow. And psychologically, we could go a long way towards bringing back some of that credibility if we ratify the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. We don't intend to test anyway. And there's a supreme national interest clause in that treaty like any other. So if you had an absolute emergency and you found that everything you'd calculated about safeguarding and stewardship of the nuclear weapons was wrong 10 years from now, you could basically invoke that. You also could put in a five-year review process internally, which was what was recommended by General Charlie Kosvili after they turned down the treaty. So I think that's one thing we could do. I think we could also, but I think this ought to be done at least in discussions with the Russians, but I don't think it, it should, uh, re doesn't require a treaty, and that is we could help increase the Russian warning time. Again, it makes no sense, and I've said this to President Putin, how is it, and I've said it to President Bush, how is it in our interest for the President of Russia to have only three or four minutes to decide whether he's got an accurate warning of an American attack, which might be a, a total mistake? How is that in our interest? The answer is, it's not in our interest. The same question ought to be asked to the Russians. How is it in their interest for uh, the United States to have only a short warning time? We have more than we did during the Soviet days, but uh, with the Russians, price of oil and so forth, they're going to come back with their submarines. They're going to start patrolling again. All of those things can be done uh, with, with Russia. The other things that can be done with Russia is, is basically the tactical nuclear weapon. Graham mentioned the tactical nuclear weapons. These are short-range weapons. They wouldn't strike the homeland of the United States, but we have a lot of them left in Europe. NATO needs to really think through this again. NATO, NATO and Russia both need to think through the first use policy uh, and the whole command and control policy. We can work with them on the question of security of command and control. A lot of it's classified. We have to be very cautious on this, but it's in each of our interests to make sure no hacker or a third country can interfere in the command and control. So all of those things can be worked on. We could also work with the Russians about where you deploy your submarines. I don't think it's in Russia's interest to have submarines right off our shore that could decapitate our nation's capital with only a few minutes warning. They, know, they don't today, but they did during the Soviet days. I don't think it's in our interest to have submarines that close to Moscow where they get less warning time. We ought to be increasing warning time. Increasing warning time increases confidence. Increasing warning time basically diminishes the chance of an accident. Uh, it's interesting that one of the people who's been talking about this, not in the detail I have today, probably a lot more cautiously, but nevertheless has talked about it, and that was the former head of our Strategic Air Command, General Cartwright, who's now the Deputy uh, Chief, Joint Chief of Staff. He's talked about warning time in several interviews. It's fundamentally in our interest in that. So there are a lot of things we can do here. I'd like to see more military military talks. I was talking to Graham about this. Uh, obviously, we didn't know where the Russians' red line was in Georgia. I don't think they know where our red lines are. We knew in the Cold War, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, they knew. Uh, but I don't think we really know that today. We've taken Russia as a weak country. They may have been weak economically. They were on their knees economically. They haven't been weak in the nuclear sense, although they're certainly not as alert as they were during the Cold War. So all of those things need to be considered. I think your question's a very good one. Please, sir. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Alexander Rossolimo. I'm president of the Center for Security and Social Progress, a think tank. Uh, five years ago, in this very room, Former Secretary of Defense William Perry said the following, quote, unless we can stem the tide of proliferation before this decade is over, nuclear weapons will be used in terrorist attacks on U.S. cities. So, Senator Nunn, my question is, what is your assessment of the likelihood of a nuclear attack by terrorists on the United States? Well, I'm going to leave it up to Bill Perry and Graham Allison to give the odds on that. I, I'm not going, not going to try to give the odds. I, I, I look at it like this. Every stockpile of nuclear material that is weapon grade all over the world has to be protected. Every time we get another one of those protected or blended down into low-enriched uranium, America is safer. 
Our foundation has spent most of its efforts for the last seven years working on securing nuclear materials. And you have to secure them where they are. And you have to get rid of them in those countries. So blending down nuclear materials will greatly diminish that. Getting the high enriched uranium into low enriched uranium. Uh, another thing that we have to do is getting highly enriched uranium that's used in commerce, uh, we have to phase that out. We have to say basically the world doesn't use weapon grade material in commerce. Uh, so we, we have to do a, a lot on that. And the other thing we have to do is try to prevent countries from enriching. If another eight, 10 countries, or even four or five, go into the enrichment process, uh, starting with Iran, it's going to be a disaster for uh, basically uh, the whole quest. So all of those things have to be done. In terms of odds, uh, Warren Buffett is a big supporter of our organization. In fact, he's our chief funder now, and he's the one who put up the 50 million on the fuel bank to try to deal with this enrichment problem. Warren has an interesting way of looking at it. He's pretty good with numbers. He says, if you look at uh, hypothetical, all of this is totally hypothetical. If you say we have a 10% chance of a nuclear weapon exploding in an American city in the next year, and you stretch that out over 50 years, so you have a 10% chance each year for 50 years, and you have a 99.5% chance that it will happen over the 50-year period. If on the other hand, you can reduce the 10% chance to 1%, you basically then have a 67.5% chance over that 50-year period of avoiding it. So the odds go dramatically in our favor if we can reduce the risk. You get a disproportionate reduction, and I, that's the way I approach it. Uh, I think every step we take makes nuclear uh, security uh, better, every step we take. But again, we get back. Uh, we have to cooperate with other countries. If they don't cooperate, we can't secure the material. And without a vision of where we're going, we aren't going to get that cooperation. This gentleman, please. Hi. My name is Gerardo Flores. I'm a student at the college. And my question relates to South Asia. India and Pakistan are not members of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and there's not really a way to add them. And beyond that, their strategic calculation doesn't really include the United States. So what can we really do to push them towards disarmament? Well, I think your question is excellent because uh, Pakistan uh, to me is the, probably the most dangerous country right now on the face of the earth. Uh, with the Islamic extremism, uh, the government is trying to stop that, and, uh, basically, but it's, it's very difficult. They have nuclear weapons and they have a giant neighbor that has stronger conventional forces. From the Pakistani point of view, there's going to have to be a resolution of Kashmir. There's going to have to be reduced uh, conventional forces in the area. They're going to have to feel more secure with India, and all of that's going to take time. Or they're not going to give up their nuclear weapons. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. The hardest, longest pole in the tent, so to speak, is, is the regional part. You've got to deal not only with Kashmir and Pakistan and India, they've had several wars. You've got to have confidence building measures so they increase their own warning time, in my view, before they get rid of nuclear weapons. Right now, there's very little warning time by India or Pakistan. And from the Indian point of view, uh, I had a very interesting conference, uh, it's been a couple of years now, with a, a bunch of Indian generals, and they were asking, they said, well, this was right after there was a flare-up between India and Pakistan, and the United States and other countries in the world basically said to India, back off, because there had been a terrorist attack in India, and they thought the Pakistanis had either done it or not stopped it, their intelligence. So they were bus mustering their conventional forces on the border. We said, back off, back off. The whole world's involved in this because it could go nuclear. And the Indian generals were saying to me, we don't think that's fair. He said, we've got our conventional advantages here. We're trying to ward off terrorism. You're tackling terrorism all over the globe. Why can't we basically threaten or even use our conventional forces? And the, the answer to that is, welcome to the nuclear world. Uh, this is where we were in NATO for years and years. We were in a situation where we didn't think we had anything like enough conventional forces. Tanks, artillery tubes, we had an early first use policy for 30 years in NATO, the United States and NATO, because of the conventional disparities. So you can't just deal with nuclear. You've got to deal with the regional animosities and conflict 
no magic formula for India and Pakistan, but it's got to be worked very hard, and the whole world has a stake there. The same thing can be said about the Middle East. Israel is not going to give up their nuclear weapons unless there is a, a peace agreement with a lot of easing of tension, a changed Middle East from what it is now. And uh, that, that we, we, we have to understand that. So all of these things have to be worked. But in the meantime, that doesn't prevent us from greatly reducing the chances of a terrorist attack. It doesn't prevent us from basically greatly reducing the uh, chances of an accident, increasing warning time, taking weapons off hair trigger. The United States and Russia uh, still have to lead the way. We've got time to work on all these things, but they all have to be worked. We also have to understand the Japanese position. The Japanese have always been under the U.S. umbrella, the nuclear umbrella. If North Korea gets a nuclear weapon, and they are on the way to it if they don't already have them, it makes the Japanese wonder what kind of nuclear umbrella they're under. So every one of those things have to, have, has to be addressed. It's a hard problem. It's not, a, not an easy problem. But what we've tried to do is set out a vision and a series of steps that have to be met and a path, pathway up that mountain. Gentleman in the lodge, please. Uh, thank you, Senator Nunn, for coming to the forum today. Uh, my name is Jay Kyram. I'm a first year master's of public policy student at the Kennedy School. And my question follows well, a previous question. Uh, I was hoping you can comment on what you think the impact and president, precedent of the nuclear treaty signed with India, given India's um, lack of signing the non-proliferation treaty and the regional situation. I think it's a boost in U.S.-Indian relationship that has all sorts of positive things. I think it's a setback for the nonproliferation effort because the Iranians, the North Koreans, and everybody we're trying to get to muster against those two nuclear programs uh, look at that and say, well, you made an exception with India. How do, you, how do you justify that? So it cuts both ways. There are positive sides and there are negative sides. I would have much preferred for us to take a little more time before we reach that agreement and gotten the Indians to basically join us in saying that within X number of years, three years, five years, you pick it, that we're going to all quit making any kind of fissile material for nuclear weapons. That would include India. Uh, they have endorsed that concept in broad terms. We have endorsed that concept in broad terms. But a U.S.-Indian agreement to, within that overall agreement, to have that kind of focus uh, to cut off the production of, of fissile materials would have had an enormous impact. And it would have put the light, in a different light, the agreement from the eyes of Pakistan and from the eyes of China. I also think it was a mistake for the administration to basically, maybe it wasn't the president's view, but there were a number of articles coming from supposedly the administration where it said that this was an effort to contain China and this was a counter move to China. I don't think India uh, wants to be used in that regard as a U.S. tool to contain China, and I don't think the Chinese would welcome that. So from the point of view of U.S.-India, it improves it. We'll have to see how history plays on the question of what it does in Pakistan, what it does in China, and whether the Indians in the United States are willing to, at some point, perhaps join with others and move towards the Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty. If we move toward that, and had some kind of understanding on no more testing, then in effect, the non-proliferation treaty goals have been broadened. Uh, the big loophole in the non-proliferation treaty, there are several, but one of them is there's no step, there's no step stone to get there. Uh, there, there. There are no steps outlined here. And you don't just go from where we are now heading down the mountain to the top. You don't just bang, start a rest and go up. Uh, you, you, you've, got to, you've got to turn it around first, and then you've got to take paths upward. All of those things have to be done. I think given the time, what we're going to do is, for the three people that are up, please, short questions, and then we'll take all three of them and let Senator Nunn respond. So in the loge, please. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Dan, and I'm a sophomore in the college. I was, wondering, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about Iran and whether you believe that... Um, Increasing the ch or war can uh, war with Iran can be can increase our security in the long term. So, a question on Iran, please, this lady. Um, I, you actually almost answered my question. It was on the U.S. nuclear 
weapons, um, U.S.-India weapons deal, but there is a, a certification that is sitting on the president's desk which says that this will, this um, deal, that this arrangement with India will not affect the non-proliferation treaty. And I don't see how he can possibly sign that. And that's what's the status of the bill at the, at the moment. And I'm wondering if you know anything about it or if you think there's any action that could be taken to make clear that some conditions like bringing back the comprehensive test ban treaty into the picture or some other conditions could be reintroduced. I mean, I know that the Indian situation complicates that. And the final point. Okay. My question has to and do... Please introduce yourself, yes? Oh, hi. I'm Judith Zinke. I used to benefit from your case studies when I was in graduate school. Thank, Thank you. you. And I'm trying to look at this through a lens, uh, which is basically uh, the relationship between um, military product entrepreneurism and um, nuclear proliferation reduction. And I wondered if you thought that with all the entrepreneurs out there manufacturing and selling and distributing in an unregulated way nuclear weapons, if it would assist your goals if there was some attempt to regulate and take out that wide market for weapons. Three easy questions, uh, please, sir. Well, of course, the, the, the biggest, uh, I hope there are no nuclear weapons for sale anywhere. Um, but if they are, we got real big problems. What I worry about even more is the nuclear materials, because I think that's what's likely. And I think as long as we have the kind of highly enriched uranium that's in commerce that uh, is spreading, in effect, uh, I think that is very dangerous. We need to basically have agreements around the world that we're going to take nuclear materials that are weapon-grade materials out of commerce. You still have low-enriched uranium. You still have nuclear fuels. I'm in favor of nuclear power. I think you have to have nuclear power. It has to be safe and secure. But we, we, we really got to work, work hard on that. Uh, but I, I do think the sales of conventional arms around the globe, uh, in many cases, is extremely destabilizing. Uh, it's, it's difficult to do much about that. Uh, it's a much, much broader kind of question. And, Basically, you'd rather have conventional arms in the seeking of a balance in a region than you would nuclear, if you have a choice between the two. I just wondered if you could just address very quickly the relationship between the U.S. producer, as a producer, and the distributor. Of nuclear, is, is there any way you can of nuclear weapons? think of a way? Yes, the tendency toward small-scale nuclear weapons and conventional. Well, we're not selling them. We, we basically have cooperative agreements with uh, some of our key allies, like Great Britain and others, but we, we do not sell nuclear weapons, and we do not intend, at least, to sell any materials that could be used on nuclear. We make mistakes. I mean, recently there was a, uh, some nuclear technology shipped to Taiwan, and they wrote us and told us about it, and it was like a year and a half later, we said, send it back. Um, <laughs> We had recently, I mean, man, Secretary McNamara knows this better than anyone, humankind is fallible. There's no such thing as not having an accident. There's no such thing as having a perfect thing. We had an Air Force plane that ended up with nuclear weapons on board, and the pilots didn't know it, the crew didn't know it, the crew that loaded it didn't know it, and the crew on the other end didn't know it. And they flew across the United States with a half load of nuclear weapons. Terrible mistake. We got an Air Force four-star general on my foundation board, General Haberger, and he said, by definition, this couldn't have happened. It's impossible. It's impossible. So, yes, we, we, human beings are fallible, and, and, and we, they're not only in the United States, but around the globe, they're fallible. The more nuclear powers we have, the more dangerous it becomes. Uh, certification. Um, the president's got s several things he's supposed to do under the Hyde Act that was passed as part of the, the approval of the, uh, of the uh, Indian Agreement. The terrible dilemma Congress is in, the administration went over and negotiated with the Nuclear Supplies Group, and they basically didn't put any of those conditions on the Nuclear Supplies Group. So by American law, if India tests, 
we're supposed to cut off cooperation on nuclear. But guess what? The nuclear supplies group, the French, the Russians, and others, are permitted to go forward with sales. So you can imagine what American industry is going to do if there's an Indian test, saying, Congress, how can you do this? So basically, we're in a catch-22. I think it's uh, too clever by half on the part of the administration. And I, I think that it's going to be very hard to reconcile the rule of law with that particular set of catch-22. Uh, a war with Iran, it, the, the, the nuclear quest of Iran is extremely dangerous. It's in our vital interest for them not to have nuclear weapons. If they have nuclear weapons, there are a number of other countries in that area of the world that are going to get nuclear weapons. There already has been a published article saying there are 10 countries in the Middle East that are asking the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, for technical assistance to start their own nuclear power program. Of course, that's what Iran says they're having. So that's fundamentally against our interest. It also would be a horrible choice to have to have a war with Iran. That would destabilize that area of the world for decades, if not longer. It's also very much in America's interest not to have any kind of conflict with the Iranians while we are in Iraq. We have hundreds of thousands of people in Iraq, civilians and military, who are extremely exposed if the Shiites, who've been basically more supportive over there than the Sunnis, decide that they have had all they can stand with the United States if we take military action against Iran. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with a pretty basic thing. We don't punish the Iranians by not talking to them. That's a fundamental mistake. We ought to be talking to them. We ought to exercise diplomacy with them. Is it going to be easy? No. But is it going to solve the problem? We don't know. We haven't tried it. We've let basically encourage the Europeans to have the dialogue with them. We have to have direct dialogue with them. And we have to do it in a way they can start at a low level. It doesn't, certainly doesn't have to start with the, with the Ayatollahs, but it needs to be done. We need to have that kind of dialogue. And I, I think we probably have enough time to do it, but the clock's ticking. And at this point in time, I think that the clock is not moving in our favor. We need to engage them in diplomacy. The fact, if we don't, if we don't solve it with them, and if we ever do have to use other instruments, whether it's strong trade sanctions or whether it's other other instruments uh, to prevent them from having a nuclear program. The fact that we have talked to them, if we indeed we do, will make an enormous difference in the support we have in that part of the world. If we have to take any stronger action without talking to them, it will be extremely, everything about it will be much more damaging to the United States. So I, I see no rationale in our national security policy that would indicate why uh, this administration has not been willing to engage in diplomacy with Iran. It's not like we have good choices on the other side. So, un unfortunately, we've come to the uh, end for today, but I think uh, for the purposes that uh, uh, Bob McNamara and family had in mind in trying to illuminate lessons from history for uh, people that have to consider issues of war and peace, we were extremely fortunate to have one of the wisest American statesmen uh, give us such a presentation and say, let's, so let's say thanks to our friend, Sam Nunn. It was absolutely terrific. Terrific. It was not good. Terrific.